Perfect. So, uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Um, this is the uh, second Perspective 2023 uh, keynote. My name is Dr. Laura Luzzi, and I'm a Chancellor Fellow at uh, Gray School of, School of Art, part of LGU. Uh, Perspective is a format that I co-chair uh, with my partner in crime, Professor Joseph Delap from uh, Aberté University. And uh, Perspective is part of SAGSA uh, International Summer School. Uh, we would like to take the opportunity to thank SAGSA and all the institutions uh, that have supported this format uh, over the years. And um, I will introduce briefly our keynote today, Dr. Misha Cardenas, who is uh, an artist, an associate professor of critical race and ethnic studies and performance play and design at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where she directs the Critical Realities Studio. Her book, Poetic Operations, proposes algorithmic uh, analysis as a method of, for developing a trans uh, of color poetics. Poetic Operations won the Gloria Anzalua Book Prize in 2022 from the National Women's Study Association. Today, Dr. Cardenas will talk about poetics of trans ecologies after men. Thank you very much, Misha, to be uh, here with us today. Yes, thank you so much, Laura and Joseph, uh, for inviting me. And thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Um, I'm very grateful to you all for being here. Um, I, okay, let's get started. Um, I, uh, I do want to acknowledge that uh, I live and work on the land of the Amamutsin people um, here in Santa Cruz. Uh, I'm not sure whose land you're on uh, in, in that, in, in wherever you are, um, but maybe we can, we can uh, talk about that in the Q&A. Um, so, yes, uh, my, my hope is to talk about... Um, a handful of different projects today. Talk about my book, uh, Poetic Operations. Uh, talk about my new book that is coming out, Adams Never Touch, and uh, some new artwork that I'm making related to Adams Never Touch. Um, yeah, I uh, I remember an event that Joseph organized, uh, Professor Delap organized, uh, uh, called Perspectives in um, was it in Reno? It was a long time ago when I was a grad student. Um, such an amazing fertile space for uh, thinking about new media art and digital media art. So I'm very happy to be here as part of this event. Um, all right, so I'm gonna share my screen. Um, okay. Great. All right. Um, here we go. Okay. So uh, the first book I want to talk about uh, is Poetic Operations, Trans of Color Art and Digital Media. Um, and uh, this book came out in early uh, 2022. And uh, it describes work that I was working on uh, since 2007, because it does describe the transporter immigrant tool. Uh, but I think the focus is more on work I've worked on since uh, 2011. Uh, so it does look at um, artwork by transgender people of color uh, and uh, specifically in digital media. And uh, there were a few motivations for this book. Um, one was, uh, you know, going to a graduate school, doing my PhD at University of Southern California. And I felt like we, uh, we were studying women of color feminism and queer of color critique. But uh, as far as I could see, um, there were no uh, trans of color critique books. Um, and I felt that 
uh, oftentimes transgender people were uh, either excluded or maligned in uh, those books of women of color feminism and queer of color critique. Um, that oftentimes if they were mentioned at all, um, they were uh, a sort of negative example. Um, and <clears throat> I felt like there was more to be said. I felt like there was something, <clears throat> there was something missing there um, in uh, the way queer of color critique was thinking about uh, the capacities uh, of trans of color art. So in this book, it is a practice-based research book. So I wrote about uh, a number of my own projects including of a number of other artists' work. I understand that uh, part of this perspective symposium is about um, graduate research, research methods. So I will say a bit about um, practice-based research. Uh, I think, lucky for you, uh, in Europe uh, and Canada, it's a kind of more established practice than here in the U.S., unfortunately. Um, so maybe you're all familiar with practice-based research. Um, but a simple way to think about it would be to say that we could learn something more or something different from doing a thing than just from reading and writing about it. Um, yeah. Or that we could learn something more or different from uh, from making art than from reading and writing about art. Uh, and so there's two main concepts in the book that I propose. One is called, uh, when I, I called algorithmic analysis. So what I mean by that is using algorithms to understand art and to understand other concerns in humanities disciplines, like the study of, uh, critical study of race and gender in particular. Um, my hope is that the book is a contribution in both directions, that it could help humanity scholars, uh, scholars of art and uh, race and gender studies, to think about algorithms and to think about how to use algorithms in their work but also, hopefully, <laughs> that it might contribute to uh, people writing algorithms uh, and studying in digital fields, studying in computer science, for example, um, to think more about art and race and gender. Um, because I think algorithms have been defined very narrowly and defined in a way that I think in many people's consciousness places them in the hands of um, a small group of people in Silicon Valley <laughs> um, who we might notice share similar racial and gender identifications. But I think often when people think about algorithms, they think about Google and Apple and Instagram and uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Steve Jobs and, um, and Bill Gates. Um, or, you know, Musk <laughs> and um, Jeff Bezos and people like that, right? Think about the algorithms that shape our daily life, like uh, like the algorithms of Zoom that put each of us in a box, <laughs> that manage what is background noise and what is not, that calculate um, what is a face and what is not to determine what is background. Um algorithms like that, right? So oftentimes when we think about algorithms, we're thinking about those algorithms. But in the book, I point out that algorithms, uh, even the word algorithm is from the name of a scholar from the eighth century, Muhammad Ibn al-Khwarizmi, um, who uh, was in Uzbekistan and wrote the book Digit Algorithmus, and was developing the ideas of algebra and uh, you know mathematical formulas as and algorithms. 
So in a way, we could think about my effort in this book as a kind of decolonization, a reclaiming of algorithms, um, to say that algorithms do not just belong to uh, a small group of white men in Silicon Valley, um, but they uh, they are in many senses, um, uh, in many senses of the word, they're ours. And something that we've been using, many of us in this room, for um, for a long time, and that these communities, that trans of color communities, I would argue, have been using for for centuries. Um, in the interest of, of, of just getting to the other part of the slide, let me say a bit about what trans of color poetics is, and then I'll get to some of the examples in the book. Um, so, so trans of color poetics is a response to queer of color critique, specifically, uh, and women of color feminism. Um, but I felt like those two ideas that critique and feminism um, were not the best suited, um, and the critique felt somehow limiting. Um, now I would sort of question that binary between critique and poetics, but hey, I was, I was a grad student when I started writing this. <laughs> yeah. Um, I do think there's, there's, there's still a useful difference to be discussed between critique and poetics. Um, but what I wanted to focus on in this book was trans of color poetics, partly because I'm an artist and I'm writing this book as an artist. So I make art, I exhibit art um, in museums and galleries. Um, it's it's really central to my practice. Um, also, the, I settled on poetics from reading uh, Clyde Taylor's critique of aesthetics and many, many critiques of aesthetics like Gloria Anzaldúa's critique of aesthetics. Um, Gloria Anzaldúa said that ethnocentrism is the tyranny of Western aesthetics. And it made me think about the limiting nature of aesthetics, how we might see aesthetics as, as a colonial viewpoint. As I'm the observer, I'm observing the object and determining its aesthetic qualities, we are separate. So instead I thought about poetics, starting with Edward Glissant, a Black Caribbean philosopher who wrote Poetics of Relation. Um, along with Gloria Anzaldúa's work, Glissant uh, was a, a huge influence on this book. Because um, Glissant argued that poetics, but instead of poetics starting with maybe Aristotle and you know a proper assemblage of words to make a good poem or identification of qualities of an object, that poetics might start with the the cry of uh, an enslaved person thrown off a ship. That poetics could be part of our life, that it could be uh, everyday gestures and speech, and um, most importantly in poetics of relation, that we could think about relations as a form of poetics, that the, the, the form our relations take, relations between people, between people and landscapes, um, between uh, islands and an archipelago, that um, that we could think of that as a kind of poetics. So I'm thinking about poetics broadly here. Um, I uh, I say poetics is um, uh, all the sort of the meeting of intention and matter, um, all of the choices that artists make or that people make in um, you know creating artworks. And trans of color, uh, I think of as a uh, unruly formation challenging ideas of identity, much like women of color feminism, like Homie King argued that the formation of women of color feminism challenged our ideas of what is race and what is gender um, by being like Kara Keeling said, an identity in difference identity based in difference. And similarly, trans of color, I think, you know, on a simple level, we're talking about transgender people of color, black and indigenous people. But I do my best in the book to unpack that and complicate it. So some of the ways 
I do that are um, through some of my own works. So uh, Local Autonomy Networks is the work of mine that's on the cover. Uh, I started working on it on, in 2011. I think I worked on it about 2011 to 2015. And it was a project to build uh, community safety networks for queer and trans people of color. It was a project uh, based in abolition, abolitionist theory. I was sort of learning from Insight Women of Color Against Violence and their book, Color of Violence, mm -hmm. that <clears throat> to build safety in women of color communities, they learned that uh, we don't want to call the police, that many people know that uh, calling the police would only result in more violence. So the question that motivated this project was to think how I could use the technologies I had been creating for my performance artwork, how I can use technologies at hand to um, build local community safety networks that did not rely on police or prisons or corporations. So local autonomy networks is quite a mouthful, so I shortened it over time to Autonets um, and uh, did a workshops in 11 different cities in uh, four different countries, uh, talking to people about those questions. And uh, the technology that I started with here was with uh, wearable electronics, so clothes uh, and bracelets that had electronic circuits sewn into them mm -hmm. with conductive thread to create a mesh network, a wireless network that didn't rely on Wi-Fi, but uh, each garment was sort of its own hub that would uh, allow other garments to connect. And uh, the idea was with that, if that, you know, if you were experiencing violence or were in danger, you could press a button, it would send out a signal, everyone in your local network would be alerted. Um, so in this picture, we're wearing some of the garments that I made there. Um, over time, through this practice-based research and community-engaged design, I talked to affected communities and showed them some early prototypes. And I'll never forget the youth in uh, this collective called Strong and Beautiful in Detroit telling me um, that this is a really cool-looking, very futuristic hoodie, electronic hoodie, but it will just bring more attention to us. <laughs> and make us more of a target here. So we would prefer that you put the, the, uh, the circuitry uh, inside the garment. So this hoodie on the right that Aisha is wearing, where she's pointing, wearing this gray hoodie, it has really simple, just LED lights around the hood and the circuitry and transmitters sewn inside the seam of the garment. Um, so, person behind her, you can, it's pretty blurry. You can just barely see the bracelet with the LED lights that uh, that she's wearing. And um, so different garments here. But what came up in this workshop in Sao Paulo was really important and changed, uh, you know, following ideas of practice-based research and community-based design, um, like that you could read in, now that you could read in, um, the book Design Justice by Sasha Costanza Chuck, amazing book. Um, I, you know, I let the feedback from affected communities direct the project. So um, when people in Sao Paulo said, that's cool that you can make a hundred dollar hoodie, but if I had a hundred dollars, I would buy a smartphone. <laughs> um, I, I said, okay, well then let's talk about how these wearable electronic garments could be a kind of prototype and how we could use the technologies at hand, meaning the technologies of movement, just the technologies of our bodies to practice um, practical safety methods. Like how do I communicate to the person next to me that I need to leave wherever we're at because I don't feel safe without letting the person on my other side know because that's the person making me feel unsafe. Um, or how do we disperse and gather in public space? How do we disperse and gather in public space if there's police present? Questions like this that we discussed. Uh, we used a theater of the oppressed for three days in this workshop, um, talking about what is safety, 
What does safety look like without police and prisons? What does safety feel like in your body? And, um, you know, some participants said, um, I don't know what safety feels like in my body. I can't say I've ever felt like that. I can't say I've ever felt safe. So then imagining even what does safety feel like? What could we do as a small group here to build safety for each other? And I feel like the most important outcome of this project was in the conversations in people coming up with actual agreements. Like, would you walk home with me? Uh, would you go with me to a doctor's appointment? Um, you know, building small local networks for safety. Other work that I write about in the book from other artists includes work by Giuseppe Camposano. I wrote about Giuseppe Camposano's work um, pretty extensively in the book in, in numerous different chapters. Um, if you've read some of the book, I'd love to hear your questions and feedback. Um, and uh, Camposano, I had the good fortune of meeting Camposano before uh, she passed away. Uh, in Bogota, Colombia, at the Hemispheric Institute of Performance and Politics. But, you know, when I met her, I had no idea that I would spend years studying and writing about her work and watching interviews with her. I feel really blessed to um, be able to do that, you know, uh, that study in a way can be an intimate connection across time and a kind of love. Um, especially for trans people, trans women, trans people of color, people whose work is often discarded or ignored. Um, so I think oftentimes when I talk about Giuseppe Camposano, people have not heard about Giuseppe Camposano's work, especially not in a, in a media art or digital art context. Um, but this is a great example here. Uh, so DNI stands for De Natura Insertus. I'm no Latin scholar, but it means something like of uncertain nature. And it's a, a play off of this um, ID card. Um, it's like a in the US, they're rolling out this real ID combination, driver's license and passport, a, a national identity document, and it's required for all Peruvian citizens. But many uh, people like Giuseppe, many travestis, travestis don't uh, can't get uh, IDs that represent them, can't get these. So she decided to make her own uh, a sort of act of forgery or digital forgery or hacking of these identity cards. And so she made a holographic version that she displayed at the Sao Paulo Biennial. And uh, when you look at this ID card from different angles, uh, it's it's hard to represent on screen. When you look at it from different angles, you would see different images of her, uh, different images of him. The gender would change. So right here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but uh, at the bottom right-hand corner of her photo, it says Genero T for travesti or travesti. Uh, and uh, when it shifts at a different angle, it uh, switches to Genero M. So the gender shifts and the image of her shifts. So Camposano was a very important example for me in this book because Camposano is a travesti artist. And so I think this gets to my point about trans of color being a kind of disruptive identity, a non-identity identity, um, one that challenges what our conceptions of identity are, our conceptions of race and gender are. Um, why is there a popular conception, or at least a conception held by the state, that you can only have one real identity? Travestis change gender at will. Uh, and it seems to me like a, like a superpower. I think Giuseppe argued that, um, you know, it is a, it is a, a kind of sacred power. Um, and so, uh, so 
in thinking about trans of color, I'm thinking about many different identities that challenge even the idea of even the idea of transgender. So the word transgender we could see coming around in 1991 through uh, medical definitions and then later picked up by activists. Um, but it was replacing many words, cacophony of different words and identities that came before it. Sometimes people talk about the transgender umbrella, uh, but of course that implies that all these identities are grouped together and smoothed over. So what I tried to argue in this book is by thinking about thinking in detail about these different identities, we could learn something more about race and gender. So by thinking about Travestis, uh, Two-Spirit, Indigenous people, um, that these identities could, uh, could challenge our ideas of gender and, and race. And also, oh, I should go back, um, and also challenge our ideas about even things like visibility. Um, so, of course, in transgender studies, uh, you know, widely understood that visibility is a trap. I think the anthology Trap Door did a lot of work there, building on um, Foucault's ideas about visibility and, um, you know, pointing out that if the state is granting the state or the corporate media um, or news outlets are granting visibility, positive visibility to some transgender people, then they're in control of that visibility and they're saying who is valid and who's not. Uh, and part of what I talk about in the beginning of this book is that after um, what was called the, this article, the transgender tipping point in Time Magazine where Laverne Cox was a black trans woman on the cover of Time Magazine, it was, uh, the article was, you know, celebrating a moment in 2014, in which it seemed like now there's enough trans people that we will stop killing them, that there will stop being violence against trans people in this country. And of course, that was not true. That year, the number of murders of trans people went up by 50%. And uh, and continues. I mean, this year we have seen unprecedented, widespread violence against trans people in the United States. Literally hundreds of laws uh, proposed. Last time I checked, uh, over 400 laws against trans people proposed in the United States just this year. So that violence not only persists, but is expanding in many different ways. And so what this work by Camposano offers us is to think about a holographic visibility. Think about a visibility that shifts depending on the perspective of the viewer, uh, that just depends on the location or perspective or shape of the um, of the person being perceived uh, that uh, shifting, uh, I argue, is a gesture of poetics, a gesture of trans of color poetics and, uh, and a method of survival. I also, in this book, talk about Raven Wings. Raven Wings is a two-spirit black Mohawk artist from Toronto. Um, and uh, we collaborated uh, extensively for years, um, and she was uh, she did a performance as part of my project uh, Redshift and Portal Metal, which I'll say more about in a minute. Um, but I, 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 in the conclusion of the book, I quoted what Raven said at this press conference because it seemed very significant to me. So this was a press conference. You can see this splash of pink and behind her. And um, this was a moment in which Black Lives Matter activists in Toronto had covered statues of colonizers in pink paint at, um, I believe it was at what's now called Tremont Toronto Metropolitan University, was at the time called Ryerson University. So what, what she said in this, press release, press conference was, you're lucky that this is all we did. You're lucky that we are appealing to your humanity. You're lucky that we're not asking for vengeance or revenge because that's easy. Our love is radical, it's abolitionist. It's a future where each and every person has what they need, what they deserve, what they want.
So it is uh, I mean, part of my approach to practice based research is to take seriously the ideas of artists and activists as people who also generate knowledge and to take seriously those words that she said there. Um, but looking at the time, I do want to continue on. Um, so some, another of my works, so a work that I, I uh, collaborated with uh, Raven Wings on is called Redshift and Portal Metal. Um, it is, I'm going to switch tabs so you can see some of the video. Oh, let me make sure that I did optimize for video and share sound. Okay. Um, mm, okay. Okay. Uh, can you still hear me? I got some errors from Zoom. Also, yes. feel free to... Yes? Oh, thank you. Okay. Also, feel free to chime in in the chat with, like, questions, uh, disagreements, collapse. <laughs> anyway, you can still hear me good. Okay. Um, so, uh, this work, Redshift and Portal Metal, is a online digital game. It's thinking about the intersections of climate change and colonialism and and trying to tell complicated stories about trans people of color, trans women of color, to think about how trans women may be the targets of violence, but could also be uh, participating in, complicit in colonization. Um, I was thinking about my place as a settler moving to Toronto and uh, what that meant um for somebody trying to work towards decolonization um so it's a you know kind of simple text-based interface i was really inspired by other trans women making games like maddie bryce's game my nietzsche and um, anna anthropy's games and um so on each screen you will see poetry and prose and get to make choices so your planet is dying do you stay and help or go to the ice planet Um, in the interest of time, I have a lot of other works to show. I will, um, just show a bit of this. Um, so on, on the different pages, there's, uh, you know, different images and backgrounds and, um, also, uh, performance works, uh, performance art pieces on some of these pages. Um, I'll tell you, doing web-based video is complicated and very browser specific and uh, made this in 2015. The technology has changed a lot. I'm impressed that it still works at all. <laughs> Let's see, some of the sound is here. It sound is kind of jarring out here, so heads up. Sounds different on different pages. Um, yes. So in this work, you do get stopped by the interplanetary border patrol. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's go back to these slides. Okay, so I wanna talk about some work after that book. It's 1038. <laughs> um, Am I am I speaking until ten fifty or ten forty five? Maybe ten fifty is fine if you need it. Great, let's do that. Sure. Um, I mean, I want to have some time for Q and A, so um, let me be more brief. Uh, moving on. So a lot of my more recent work is really I've really been engaging with Sylvia Winter, a Black Caribbean philosopher, um, and um thinking critically about the human um, 
as is in the title of the talk. I did want to address it. Um, so in this book, Being Human as Praxis, uh, uh, edited uh, by Catherine McKittrick, uh, Sylvia Winter says this. Um, this is a, a, a dense bit of theory, so let me just uh, talk about it briefly. She says, French philosophers have assumed that as middle-class philosophers, their referent we, that of man too, is isomorphic with the referent we in the horizon of humanity. So assuming that when we say man, she calls man too, or the kind of man defined by science and by uh, theories of evolution. Um, that... Um, that in, in short, oh, come back, that in short, French, French philosophers, when thinking of man, thinking about people like themselves. She says, I'm saying here that the above is the single issue with which global warming and climate instability now confront us, and that we have to replace the ends of the referent we of liberal monohumanist man too with the ecumenically human ends of the referent we in the hum horizon of humanity. So here she's... Uh, thinking about Derrida's concept of the horizon of humanity. And I think uh, part of how I understand this quote is Sylvia Winter telling us that if we look at uh, global warming and climate instability, that if we think, how is it that we could have gotten to this place of being on the precipice of such catastrophe? She says that part of the problem is the way humanity has been defined and who falls inside and outside those definitions. At many different times in history, and I think she would argue today, uh, people of color, black people, trans people, uh, disabled people, indigenous people, uh, women, so many different people have diff different times been defined outside the definition of humanity or of man. And so if we look at the global situation of climate change, we could see that the people most harmed by climate change are the people who've contributed the least. And I would argue that this is uh, colonization, ongoing effects of colonization. I think that's what Sylvia Winter is telling us here. Um, so in my more recent work that I'm writing about in this new book called After Man, um, I talk about this work, Seen Soul, um, which means no sun. It's an augmented reality work about um, wildfires and climate change induced wildfires and their effects uh, on trans people, specifically trans people, disabled people and immigrants. Um, I think I could show this trailer. Hello. Those who traveled across borders and built homes here could only run to the ocean for fear of ice agents at the shelters. How I coated my own body and soul. How I escaped the bright orange wall of raging eyes of flame. So this augmented reality work is on the App Store if you want to see it. Um, and it's about this character, uh, this uh, translatina AI hologram. Her name is Aura. Uh, and um, through poems and um, through the physical movement, movement of the viewer through a large space, you, you can't do this in your living room. You need to go outside. Um, through that movement, you get this story about wildfires and how Aura survived and um, this future scenario. Um, and part of how she survived is through uh, multi-species interdependence or through uh, her dog support, love from her dog. <laughs> uh, this is pretty much my dog, Roja, <laughs> um, who's sitting over there. Um, I wanted to make a 3D model of her because I love her and I want her to live forever. Um, but also to really engage with John Haraway's writing, thinking about multi-species interdependence, 
thinking about the reality that we survive altogether or not at all. And uh, it's based on my experience of living through wildfires and smoke storms and um, and within weeks of releasing this work, uh, a lot of the talk in here about evacuation was based on news stories. But within literally weeks of releasing this work on the App Store, I had to evacuate my own home because of wildfires here in Santa Cruz. Um, so the work after seen soul that I made was called Oceanic, uh, queering the ocean. Well, it was called Oceanic, and it's a multi multidisciplinary, multi part work, uh, including a, a short film and installation uh, and um, poetry. Um, I'm actually going to switch over here to email because I recently received the uh, more high quality images of the installation. So this was at the Leslie Lohman Museum in New York over the summer it was the front facade of the museum. And um, that work we called Oceanic Portal. And it was engaging with the writing of um, Chicana feminist Gloria Anzaldúa, um, because Gloria wrote about this beach and this bridge, saying that bridges are portals to other realities. And in that essay she wrote, it's called Unnatural Bridges, Unsafe Spaces. It is, as far as I know, the first published piece of writing in which someone said that trans women should be part of women of color feminism. And that was very significant to me. So I, I made this work on this beach about this beach. And, you know, when I started, it was more about sea level rise and climate change. Um, but in 2020, um, I had my foster daughter. In 2021, my foster daughter went back to her biological family. And the work really became for me about grief and loss and thinking about losing places to climate change and losing people to COVID. And for some of my collaborators, Cynthia Ling Lee, Gerald Cassell, Susana Ruiz, Huey Truong, and Ian Costello, I think the work was also even just about losing our own physical capacities to COVID. Um, so thinking about how do we move through loss and still build new queer trans abolitionist futures. Um, so in the last couple of minutes, let me just mention, um, I have a uh, a new book, a sci-fi novel called Adam's Never Touched that comes out on October, they keep changing the date, it comes out on October 10th, 2023. Um, I'm doing like a, some, a little book tour. So um, the only European stop is Barcelona, October 9th, because <laughs> I have a friend there. <laughs> um, but, uh, I would be very happy. I, I, I wish I was in Scotland. I've never been there. My family's Irish. I would love to come visit you all and talk about this novel um, in person. I wish I could be there with you in person today. Um, so Adam's Never Touch is a sci-fi story about uh, trans Latina women. And I tried to write a, a trans genre novel. So there's three main characters and each one is like a kind of different kind of science fiction. So um, one of them is more like hard science fiction. You're gonna hear a lot about computer hacking, about the technologies and hardware she's using and the algorithm she's writing to hack into prison systems and free people and abolitionist hacking. Um, the other character is more like a trans real sci-fi or more like Octavia Butler, more like worlds that are much like our own, but a little bit different. You know you're in a, a you're in an alternate universe that looks like ours, and then the third character in this book is more like science fantasy. So that's like a world of science fiction fantasy, science fiction with magic. So I tried to put them all together in this short book. Um, I really really hope people enjoy it. But the artwork I'm working on now, most presently, is inspired by that book. So I thought you know I I imagined this engine to to travel that, that these two trans women created a machine to travel to other realities. Um, so I'm working on a series of artworks now based on that. It's called the probability engine. And in our research, we've been looking at climate change tipping points. This article from September 22 that says, if we exceed 1.5 degrees, we could triple trigger multiple tipping points. And there was a map of the global tipping points in that article. I'm working with a concept artist, Star Hagen Esquerra, Another artist, I mean, they're an amazing artist. 
And together we made this map, uh, a kind of more artistic rendition of these global warming tipping points, still containing the information from the article. So at you know less than two degrees, we might be triggering tipping points like the uh, the Greenland ice sheet or the Atlantic meridian ocean currents. Um, between two and four degrees, there are other tipping points that could be tipped. And um, at above four, we might be tipping points like the permafrost in Canada. And uh, in this work, we're looking at um, both effects and solutions, possible futures. So we made these icons. I'm happy to come back to these in Q&A for each of the tipping points. The Amazon forest, the Labrador Sea, the subpolar gyre, the coral reef die-off. Um, here's some of Star's uh, sketches, concept art for this work. Um, our first exhibition's in Montreal in March. Um, where we're going to show some of these tipping points. Um, but of course, the effects of climate change and sea level rise are here now. This is just minutes from my house, uh, from my home in March of this year. The levees broke in Pajaro Valley and, and flooded this farming farm worker community. Um, you know, just from the weather here on the city of Monterey, they said can become an island. Um, and of course, the horrible, just devastating news about Libya and Derna, I'm sure we all know. Um, but, you know, the flooding there, the dam breaking there, I mean, these things are, are climate change effects that are happening now that are going to be happening in more places. Um, part of the project I'm working on is thinking about the seawall here in San Francisco. Um, it's well known that the seawall in San Francisco that created downtown San Francisco is about 100 years old. It's not seismically sound. So they're working on new seawalls. And um, this is some of the concept art for what we're thinking about. Thinking about the seawall critically and imaginatively, looking at the way scientists are building seawalls that that coral could grow on to address part of these climate change harms. And uh, I'll stop there so we could go to Q&A. Thank you so much for your time. Um, thank you for your patience. I'd love to hear what you thought. Thank you, Misha. Usually, 